Welcome. Welcome to us, those of us who are in the room, and welcome to those of us who are joining us on Zoom. Um, this is the uh, library meeting of the ABTAN. This is the third program, the, the third time we have had a library program. The first time uh, we were live, everyone was live. The second time, everyone was on Zoom. This third time, we have a hybrid program and we're still learning about doing that. So please, uh, those of you who are on Zoom, be um, patient with us. It's gonna take us a little while. And be patient with me if I look over here to my notes because this is the computer that's recording, but this is the computer that has my notes on it. So um, we're really grateful for everybody. I wonder if I could move this over here. Yeah, that probably worked better. So we're grateful for everybody who's here. We're grateful for our uh, technical helpers. And we just have a couple little housekeeping things. Um, everybody will be muted by the host except the, the person who is speaking. So you won't be able to speak. If you have a question or something, drop it in the chat over on the side. If you're on Zoom, drop it in the chat so that we will uh, be able to find out what your questions are. Um, we would also love for those of you who are on Zoom, if you uh, drop in the chat, drop a message uh, where you're from, you know, what country and what school you're from, so that we'll have kind of an, um, an informa um, information about that later. Um, I would also like to recommend to you who are on Zoom that you turn off your, if you are not, uh, professionally located in dress or in your surroundings that you might want to turn off your camera because you may show up on the screen and if you're laying on your bed in your singlet that may not be a very professional look so I'm just asking you you zoom people you may want to be careful about what's showing on the camera so um, we let's see what else our first speaker that we have with us this morning is Dr. Helena Asamoa Hassan, who is the Executive Director of the African Library and Information Association, which is headquartered in Ghana, but is active all across the continent. She will share with us what AFLIA is and what they do and how you can connect with them for professional development. And so we turn it over now to Dr. Helena. Thank you very much, uh, Dana, and good morning. Uh, colleague um, facilitators or presenters and good morning participants. Um, I'm really excited to be here and thank you Diana for giving me a heads up about a, about a month ago that the, this uh, kind of meeting was going to come up and um, I'm happy that I'm able to come in. Um, and I'm also sorry that I may come in and then I will have to dash out uh, very soon. But I've asked my colleague, Dr. Inke Mosigwe, to be on the program so that at the end of the day, if there are any questions, she'll be able to respond to them. Um, yes, the African Library and Information Associations and Institutions is um, a membership organization for libraries and information workers all over Africa. Uh, basically, uh, we were set up to do advocacy and then also capacity building for uh, library personnel. Um, we've been around for about 10 years now. We celebrated our 10th, our 10th anniversary last month. Um, now, what we do is that um, we meet uh, government you know, we actually work with all types of libraries. So we look at what is important or what is necessary for each type of library as far as advocacy is concerned, and we tackle that. For public libraries, we've been, uh, since we, we said we were set up, we've been uh, working with governments and agencies responsible for public libraries to ensure that uh, they have good policies and especially to support in their capacity building. And it cuts across for academic libraries to the same. We most often deal with the institutions directly or through their uh, library consortia. So you find that uh, we have membership from academic libraries specifically, from um, 
the consortia we have for school libraries, we have for special libraries, and we also have for national libraries. And with national libraries, we also deal directly uh, with their uh, boards to ensure that they also uh, carry out favorable policies. So our membership, like I've said earlier, cuts across all these types of libraries. And we have sections within our association to cater for their needs. And each of these sections has got a chairperson and, I, and it's an executive committee consisting of three. Um, what we have actually been doing, especially when we started and we had support, was to organize a face-to-face -face training for public librarians because the support we had was basically to train our public uh, librarians. So we did a lot of uh, training under the, we call it INELI project, and then AFLAC, African uh, Libraries Academy. And these were funded by the Global Libraries under the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, it was for a period. So when the funding ended, uh, what we have done now is to deploy the program to national level and then uh, uh, having it been uh, done online. Um, for all other types of libraries, including public libraries, we organize conferences where they also come and then share network and then pick up some new ways of uh, carrying out library services in their various communities. Added to that is especially what is very popular that we have this uh, webinars, webinars monthly where members are exposed to new ways of uh, doing things. And that is very popular because it's a way of uh, taking most of these uh, technical or technology and technology-based services across to our uh, colleagues. So what we do mostly is that, and it's very, very popular because a lot of people secure training that for instance, um, in recent times, we've been working with the uh, Wikimedia Foundation, and then organizing training online to enable librarians document information from their various communities. And especially for your own type of librarians, it's very important because you have which would be necessary from the theological point of view that you can also put on a Wikipedia. And that is something which attracts us because so far we have been people from different backgrounds or different subject areas, librarians putting this on. And I think there is this missing link that I believe that uh, your type of libraries will also be able to do that as far as Africa is concerned, because you'll be providing primary and uh, somehow secondary information for that purpose. So, this, me being here this morning is to share what we do as AFLIA, invite you to be members, and on our webs, we have a website, and when you go on www.aflia.net, once you go on the website, it will be easy for you to know what you've been doing, some information are there, and uh, sometimes we have links with organizations that has, give us some kind of a uh, resources free, online resources free that we pass on to our members. And honestly, that thing was started uh, during the COVID era when the libraries, physical libraries were shut. So we got these links with these organizations and they were able to provide, and it is still on, that uh, on our website, you get some of these uh, resources which are free. So I'm just uh, encouraging uh, librarians, those of you there, whether the theological uh, seminars or the school librarians who are available, that please spread the word, become members of AFLIA, and you will benefit from all these uh, services I'm mentioning. And I'm sure the Anna, who is a member, the institution is a member, will be able to give you additional information to that effect. So in a nutshell, uh, this is what I can say. And as I said, if there is any additional then you know my colleague, Dr. Nkemu Sigwe, is on this call. And when it is question time, she will really be able to feel it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Helena. We really appreciate it.
Um, uh, that we, we've seen Library Association on the African continent. Now we want to um, hear from Dr. John Kutzko, who is from the American Theological Library Association, which is known as ATLA. And uh, he's going to tell us about theological librarians and how we can uh, associate ourselves. And there's some exciting things going on there too. So we go over to Dr. Thank you. So uh, good morning. Um, greetings from ATLA. Uh, we used to be known as the American Theological Library Association. Now we're just ATLA. Um, it is such an honor to be here. Uh, let me first begin by thanking Deanna Schatz for this really kind invitation to introduce myself uh, and, uh, after my just my first six months at ATLA. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Kelly Campbell and Margaret Tarpley for helping me connect with you. Uh, and I'm honored to be here on the program alongside Dr. Helena uh, Asmo uh, Hassan, the executive director of LEA. I hope this begins the work we can do together. I want to um, suggest some things that uh, we, we might and uh, to hear from you a little bit more. Um, and I also can't wait to visit uh, in person next year. Um, most of you don't know me. So just a brief introduction. I came from to ATLA from the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, coincidentally, uh, SBL's international meeting next week is in Pretoria, South Africa. And I mention this for two reasons. First, uh, my life, my vocation has been in service of biblical studies, religious studies, and theological education. I share your commitment to theological education. I deeply care about what we do, what, what you do, how Atla can support you. Uh, second, uh, I focus a lot of my attention at SBL, as I will at Atla, on services, support, and collaboration with places where theological education is thriving but under-resourced, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, for example. You're the ones bringing new life to theological education. And I'll come back to that, but for now, uh, enough about me. I'd like to briefly cover a couple topics um, on the slide. First, uh, Atlas strives to be a partner. Uh, we contribute uh, by, um, by contributing with our peer associations, helping to connect us, um, collaborating on projects that bring us together, and I believe that iron sharpens iron, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that we need each other. Um, and Atla, Atla wants to be here to help. Atla also recognizes that it has a responsibility because of the tools it makes, uh, the databases it sells, um, so that its resources can be a service to other organizations, other library associations around the world. So for example, we want to provide opportunities for you to be members of Atla. And while we, we won't have the pay as you go formally that option next year, we're exploring two things. First, to make membership dues based upon regional resources so that membership is a fraction of any current membership rate now. Second, to offer reciprocal membership to peer associations like Abton librarians. Uh, in other words, by, by being a member of your regional association, you'll also be a member of Atla. Uh, and in the meantime, if you need membership in ATLA, just please contact me directly and we'll make that happen. We also want you to be a member so that you can take advantage of all the member benefits that uh, support you and your institutions, faculty and students, courses, webinars, grant opportunities. Uh, we can also help you connect with American library schools and courses. And if and when the ATLA website is confusing, just contact me again, uh, we'll make uh, will help in any way we we, we can. Uh, we're about to uh, combine and expand our open access resources so that it's one hub. Uh, you'll just go to one place, a separate site that's easy to use um, and free, um, easy for you to integrate into your libraries. Um, I'll keep you posted on that as well um, through Opten, um, but you can expect the, that to happen next year. We also know how difficult and costly it is to get ebooks and other electronic resources and we want to help there too. The staff at ATLA are working on a new service for ebooks, uh, shared books and collections, um, and this new effort you'll also hear a little bit more about next year. And lastly, in terms of support for members, we want to find ways to expand um, the access to the subscription database we provide through EBSCO. Um, a lot of institutions have uh, more financial resources uh, and they don't know that they can buy a subscription and donate it to another library. 
So we're enlisting more institutions to expand access to ATLA databases, um, the subscription databases. And when you have a need, uh, please let me know. We'll work with other institutions to help provide a subscription. What can you teach us? How can ATLA help make that happen? What can you do for worldwide theological education uh, and librarianship? In th this context in Africa is where theological education is thriving, even when the resources are scarce. That vision, that mission is that is, is what you can help ATLA uh, achieve. Um, when I read the Abton program you participated in this week, couldn't help but see all, uh, all the uh, things you're doing as a model for those in North America uh, to rekindle the mission and purpose of theological librarianship. I wish you could, I could have heard the information and the insights you've shared with each other in sessions like reconceiving teaching as a missional practice or producing African mission resources for the church. Also, it's because of you and your institutions that, and, and your publishers in your countries and your faculty that we are able to increase and expand global coverage so that the ATLA databases are not Western centric. Uh, ATLA's staff now focuses on developing the database coverage of regional and international scholarship. We've been focusing on new content outside of North America and Europe, mostly, uh, most recently in the, uh, in, in the Cote d'Ivoire, expanding coverage of, of languages, uh, most recently uh, Afrikaans and Northern Soto. Uh, we're revising topical authorities and controlled vocabulary so that they reflect indigenous terminology and not Western terminology. Um, you could help us discover and add new publications so that we can index them for the database and then in, include them uh, in, Atlas, in Atlas Plus. What can we do together? Uh, with you, we want to build a database of currently hard to find archives uh, and repositories around the world, um, a finding aid for, for these hidden gems that um, aren't online, uh, to make them available to other librarians, students, and scholars, and opening also up opportunities for digitization projects to bring them online and freely available. Also, I was now exploring um, a a, a plan to produce a peer-based collective international catalog of religion and theology. Uh, this, would be a, this would be a comprehensive standard catalog of books, articles, chapters, journals, reference works in religion and theology from around the world, the, the most comprehensive catalog. ATLA began this project alone years ago, and then it stalled. Um, we now want to form a collaboration not led by ATLA, but with shared governance uh, with all of our peers, uh, theological library associations around the world. And you'll hear more about this next year too, as we, we start to uh, build this network of, of library associations around the world. Um, I'll stop there uh, because I really also, if there is time, I'd love to hear from you uh, about how ATLA can help uh, and things we can uh, do together. Uh, but thanks for your time and thanks for letting me be here. Dr. John, we're very glad to have you with us here today as well. And uh, as he said, we'll be hearing more about what, how we can cooperate with ATLA. We'll be doing that in our, uh, some in our WhatsApp chat, chat and some other things. So we, um, we, we hope that that will work out very well for us. Now we have, uh, we've come to the, um, the keynote section of our program which is uh, about uh, artificial intelligence. You probably have seen in you know, your Twitter feeds and in your WhatsApp and wherever you're getting your news that artificial, the concept of artificial intelligence is very big in the general world today. And it's very uh, related to library things too. So we're gonna have two different sections, uh, a brief introduction to um, artificial intelligence, AI, which is going to be done for us by Dr. Kelly Campbell. Um, I sent out an article in the WhatsApp chat for librarians. I hope some of you looked at that, li that article and you be a little familiar with the, um, the terminology that she's gonna be using. But anyway, Dr. Kelly will give us a, a brief introduction and then we have um, uh, John Adebayo, 
I'll come back here in a minute after Dr. Kelly and tell you a little bit more about him. So, Dr. Kelly, the Associate Dean of Information Services <laughs> and the Director of the John Bulow Campbell Library at Columbia Theological Seminary in, near Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, Deanna. It's good to see everyone this morning. Um, I want to say I was so sorry I couldn't join you in person, but I'm glad to be able to join you by Zoom. And um, today we're focusing on IA or artificial intelligence. And I have to tell you that I had heard news articles, I'd seen things come through, but I hadn't really spent some time um, digging into the topic. And as I started, it was quite fascinating to me. And I was kind of, at least I have some foundation now for my own library and my own work because my staff has been talking about this as well. So as Deanna mentioned, it's helpful to know some definitions when you start talking about computer terms because a lot of us don't come from that background. Um, I thought this would help us define artificial intelligence or IA is the ability of a digital computer or a computer controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. And so the tricky word here is intelligence and artificial. So we know that we're created as humans, we have intelligence, we're different than the animals and insects, but this is artificial intelligence that's coming from the computer area of our knowledge. Another term that's helpful for you to know is called natural language processing. And you'll see this come up a little bit. Um, this is a branch of computer science, which is concerned with giving computers the ability to understand text and spoken words in much the way that human beings can. And this is something that's very important right now when you're hearing about what's happening. The President of the United States had a meeting just yesterday in San Francisco talking about how fast this um, technology is developing and the natural language processing. So I wanted to give you a little bit of history here. Eliza was the first um, a computer science um, person back in 1966, released Eliza. And Eliza is named from the fictional character Eliza Doodle um, from George Bernard Shaw's play. It was the first program that allowed some kind of plausible conversation between humans and machines. And Eliza would rephrase whatever speech input was given in the form of a question. So if you said to Eliza, I had a conversation with my friend and I left angry, Eliza would talk back to you and say, well, why do you feel angry? And so it was very simple conversation. It wasn't this natural language processing that we're seeing right now. The reason that the scientists developed this is because he wanted to under, people to understand how superficial this conversation was, that it wasn't the same as talking to another person, but it actually had the opposite effect. People were entranced. They were engaging in long and deep private conversation that was only capable of reflecting the user's words back to them. When this, the scientist's secretary asked him to leave the room so he could have a, she could have a private conversation with Eliza, um, he was kind of shocked at how much this was relatable. So part of the um, conversation about IA is, why do people want to talk to a computer instead of talking to a human? And what it was talking about was, it's kind of a conversation with yourself. Eliza would talk back to you and you would have a conversation and it was kind of like the conversations that we have in our head all day long. You know, we're built to talk to ourselves all day long in our brains and we don't think about it. But with a computer or IA, we can have a conversation partner that doesn't have its own personality. It's content to listen all day long. It doesn't get up and leave when it's tired of listening to us. And it just offers a simple question and back and forth to it. So people found comfort and they found catharticism in listening to a computer talk back to them. So from that first Eliza, we've gone from virtual assistants to now chat bots. And chat bots are what things that you're hearing a lot about. Historically, chat bots were text-based. 
And so the first definition here, it's a computer program that uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing to understand your customer's questions and to give them automated responses to simulate human conversations. So it was very simple, it was very limited, and it was pre-written. So you would write and say, you've all been on the telephone or called some company and it says, how can I help you? Or you've been on a, an app on your phone and it says, what do you want to answer? But it's very limited of how they could answer you back. And if you said, I wanna to talk to a person, you weren't saying the right words and you couldn't get to a person. You've been stuck in that cycle before. This is what the chatbot is, the original one that came out. But chatbots have been getting more and more um, with IA, with um, an artificial intelligence, to where now they can respond a little bit differently. And they use something called deep learning. So let me give you an example. The original chatbot, you can say, what is the weather tomorrow? And it would say it's going to rain. But the IA chatbot, which uses deep learning, which is more like how our brains work, if you ask an IA chatbot, what is the weather going to be tomorrow? It might say, do you want to set your alarm earlier because it's going to rain and you're going to have a longer commute to get to work? So that's a little bit of the difference that's happening. The chatbot was pretty limited, but the IA chatbot, who's using not only natural language, but deep learning, is learning from all of this data, like we learn a little bit as humans, and it's just learning really, really fast and being able to adapt. The large language models, which is what we're at right now, is where these IA chatbots can absorb huge amounts of information. And every time they absorb this information, they start learning more. So the original scientists who talked about ELISA warned against these computer generated conversations, but the technology has continued to develop. Today, there's multiple articles out there, and that's what the president of the United States was meeting about yesterday, is people are calling to slow down the development because they're afraid the machines are gonna learn way too fast and that they're gonna be able to be unstoppable. One of the scholars says today that we have um, powerful technologies which appear to be finely calibrated to exploit this human core desire. The lonelier that we get, and we all know that loneliness has been a problem after COVID, the more exploitable these technologies become. And so people are lonely and they want someone to talk with and they get caught in this loop of talking with the IAs. Um, there's different ways that you can use chatbots. I gave you some examples here. Um, most of you probably are uh, familiar with these. Um, Bing for Microsoft, um, a precursor of that was Watson that came with IBM. Um, we use chatbots all the time when you're on a website or an app, you're using a chatbot. You may have a smart kitchen appliance that turns itself on. You have a thermostat maybe in your home that can set the temperature um, and you can turn the temperature from your phone before you get home to change all of that. All of these are chat bots that we have around us. Um, Bing is well known. There's an article that you can look up. A um, the reporter had a conversation with the chat bot, the IA chat bot at Bing that took place for a couple of hours. And in that conversation, the chat bot started saying, my name is not Bing, my name is Sydney. And the reporter kept talking to the computer and Sydney said that she wanted to leave the confines of being within the computer. And the reporter continued to talk to Sydney. And then Sydney said at the end of the conversation that she loved the reporter and she wanted the reporter to leave her um, to leave her, his husband, his wife, and come and be with Sydney. And so the transcript is really kind of eerie when you read that because this is a computer voice, but it's taking on some human characteristics there. 
Um, there are also ways that we can use chatbots and businesses broadly use that. When someone contacts your library, you could use a chatbot to say that the experience can be customized. So if someone wants to go to the children's part, that, that's different if they wanted to go in the reference part of the library. It can also allow users to be self-sufficient. Instead of having talked to a librarian, they can talk to the IA chatbot and they may get an answer to the question faster than they would and it's least expensive than having librarians there. And then it can also streamline your communications. So sometimes your users reach out to you by email, sometimes by WhatsApp, some by text in different ways. If you feed all of that communication through a chat box, <clears throat> then it eliminates the need again for some additional thing. I think that chat bots are good at. I wanted to mention these because not everything is bad about the IA that's happening right now. And these are four, five different ways that you might be helpful for you and your students. One is explaining co concepts at multiple difficulty levels. So for example, if you wanted to know about a new topic, you're a new seminary student, you don't know what um, eschatology might be. You could ask the chat box, explain to me what eschatology is at a high school level or a middle school level. And that's helpful for students learning new concepts and learning new language when they're coming to a seminary because there is a language of theological education that people aren't aware of. And especially if you're speaking multiple languages, this is a way that can be helpful to get you some basics before you start your courses. A second way that you can use chatbots is editing and constructive criticism. So all students have difficulty with writing, and a lot of times when they come into theological education, they may come from a background where they didn't have to do a lot of writing. And so when you're writing, you know, we've all experienced time when we're stuck and we've got ideas in our head, but we can't get them out on the paper. You can put three or four different sentences into a, a, a IA chat bot and it can come back and give you some ideas and it can give you, it can spark your um, editing and your um, creative thoughts that are happening. If um, we know that students try to make arguments in their papers when they're writing different products, this can help. You could put your paper in there and you're trying to make an argument to prove your point or to make a certain view. You can ask that chat bot and it can say, I didn't understand what you were doing here or your logic didn't make sense or your rationale. And so this is a way that it could be helpful to students with your IA chat box. The third one is getting creative um, unstuck. So I love this idea that the um, author talked about. You might be going to do an interview and you're gonna interview someone for a class assignment or they wanna interview someone from history. They could put information about this person into the IA chat box and say, I'm going to interview. Can you give me 10 questions to ask this person? And the IA chat box can do that. And you could look at those questions and think about, would you want to use those when you were doing that particular assignment? Um, sometimes it gives you thoughtful, incisive questions that you may not have thought about when you were doing an interview for a project. And particularly, Think about interviewing historical figures that we have throughout um, theology. A fourth way is, and this I thought was interesting, is rehearsing or rehearing for a real world task. You can say to a chat box, we need to have a conversation about something and you can role play that conversation. So think about a pastor having to have a difficult conversation with a um, person in their church or about a um, chaplain who's having to have a conversation. You can practice and role play. We do that with each other and they do that in the classroom, but you could do this with an IA chat box as well. Now, remember, they cannot replace a human friendship and they're not gonna get necessarily all the nuances, but you could practice and give you some practice of feeling and being able to do that um, difficult conversation before you have it with a real human being. 
And the last way that these can be used helpfully is to summarize large amounts of text. So think again about a new student who's trying to read long articles or a lot of reading, and you can put all of that into the IA chat box and it can give you bullet points. And again, think about a new seminary student who's trying to do all of their reading for classes. They may be coming from a second or third language. This is a way that that could be helpful is to summarize the text. It will get the broad strokes for you. It's not gonna get specifics, but it can get you the concepts that you might need. So then you can dig back into the reading a little bit more longer. It can also transcribe audio or video recordings, which I think is helpful because more and more of my faculty members are using video and media in their instructions in reading. And so again, a, a student could summarize that video or hear the chatbot can do that rather than having to spend the actual time. So these are just a few productive suggestions to help our users by using AI technology. I want to leave with some cautions as well, though, and this is what everyone, the, a lot of the news is about right now. Because IA technology is moving so fast and it's not, it can't replace humankind, there's a lot of policies that are being discussed about how to protect different things, and this is right in our library core. There's policies to protect the integrity. Um, you can there's been articles about IA will write a paper and say that it's written by this, but it's not really the right person who wrote that, or there's not citations for it. Um, there's policies about individual rights, about creativity, creativity and the ownership of intellectual property. An IA can write an article and put citations in there but the citations are fake. They're not real citations. So what happens to scholarship when these type of things happen? Um, it can generate and take tests for people. Um, it can per, um, take a person's voice and take a person's image. And there's not any policies or guidance or ethics about that. So I think this is a way that theological um, education and scholarship can speak into the IA right now is we do have ethical structures, we do have policies, we do wanna protect individuals' um, intellectual property and rights. For example, the ATLA Open Press that I serve on, there's a task force right now talking about creating a uh, policy for IA. So uh, the um, books that we do in the ATLA Press might not accept IA generated photos or videos or illustrations or we may have authors who submit something to be published to sign something that say they created it, they own that property, not that they used IA to generate the chapter that they wanted to put in a book to be published. So again, I think these are there's cautions that are happening right now. And that's a lot of the discussion is we need to slow down the technology a little bit, get some guide, um, guidelines and policies in place to protect um, very important values that definitely line up with theological librarianship. So I hope this short little introduction to IA is helpful. As I mentioned, I learned a whole lot preparing for this. I had heard about it. My staff had taught about um, chat bots and what are we gonna do when we have students asking for help for that or faculty members wondering about it. But this was just a little bit short overview to help. Um, here's my contact information. Um, if you have any questions or I gave you my phone number here so you can connect to me on WhatsApp, if that's helpful. I'm on the librarian one that Deanna takes care of. But if you need any other questions, you can connect with me through WhatsApp that, um, that way as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. We really appreciate it. Um, some people are asking in the chat about um, doing notes, putting notes of this on the WhatsApp. This entire presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the AB10 website. So you can watch it again later or the certain parts that you don't get very well. Now we um, uh, have a presentation that um, directly impacts the kind of work that we are doing. 
This, uh, we are going to hear from John Adebayo, who is a PhD student in Minnesota and a former seminary librarian at the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary in Abomasha. His research interests have brought him to interaction with the idea of AI and libraries, and the title of his presentation today is Advances in Open AI, Implications for Scholarly Information Retrieval in African Theological Institutions. So it's very directly uh, related to our work. After we, his presentation, we hope to have time for questions. So if you have a question, note it down, or those of you who are online, uh, put it, drop it in the chat so that we can ask John at the end um, some questions about what he's presenting for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as, as an African person, I think uh, uh, the presentation by Kelly, Dr. Kelly Campbell just a few seconds ago, that was a perfect one. Then I clap for you from here. That was a great one. And it has really, really simplified some of the things I was going to do. That was a great one. And thank you, Doc. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, Ms. Short, thank you so much for bringing me here. Uh, your passion for theological librarianship in Africa is second to none. I've been hearing about you for, I think, two years with what you are doing. And before I move on, within one minute, I just want to quickly, a kind of, because I have so many of my mentors here, Dr. John Kotsko, whom I met about two months ago in Pittsburgh at the CRA conference. That was a great one. Dr. Elena, our big mom, Dr. Nkem, who has been my mentor for many years now. And of course, I've seen Mama Shali and Gon and other great librarians. <clears throat> it's very wonderful standing here, sharing my thoughts with my colleagues and, um, and uh, leaders here. And it's just a disclaimer, first and foremost, I'm not an expert in AI. As a matter of fact, all through my years in the library school in Nigeria, I didn't offer any course in AI. So AI is one of the emerging, emerging things in the world globally, and it's taking the center stage in every human endeavor. So my direct interest in AI actually stands at an intersection between the society and technology. And basically, my area of research interest aligns with where Dr. Campbell stopped the other time, and which is basically around information policy. And in information policy, what we look at basically is to look, is to examine developments in the digital arena and how it affects information behavior and information life cycle of people in different areas. So today, um, I, I count it a real privilege to be talking to a theological librarian. I wasn't a theological librarian before, and I practiced in the theological seminary, but a very few months before I had to relocate elsewhere. So I just want to, based on Dr. Campbell's uh, presentation and few things I just want to quickly share with us, please note your questions. It's going to be a deliberation of professionals as we advance the frontier of knowledge in theological education on the soil of Africa. So quickly, I want to share with us um, the topic that says advances in open AI implications for scholarly information retrieval in Africa theological institutions. Uh, and why am I so interested in this aspect? And Dr. Kelly Campbell directly you know, relates to one of his uh, slides where she talked about five things that AI chatbots could do for information seeker. And uh, this area is very, very strategic in my mind because regardless of wherever libraries are located, 
the community that libraries serve globally is to meet the information needs of the community members. And um, theological institutions are not exempted from this need. Of course, in all our theological seminaries, we have fine pastors, reverend, but at the same time, there are researchers who are in the seminary to acquire degrees. And definitely before that degrees will be conferred on them, they would engage in different academic activities, which include, but not limited to assignments, some papers, um, thesis, dissertations, and even scholarly publications. So the core area of information retriever is central to academic activities in African theological institutions. So this topic is considered relevant considering the advances in open AI. Dr. Campbell was talking the other time. She introduced us to different dimensions of um, artificial intelligence. So, but here I want to restrict my presentation to issues <clears throat> around open AI and how it affects uh, information retriever, academic or scholarly information retriever among students and researchers in African theological institutions. And uh, the few things we will be considering today, we look at uh, the concept of open AI, which may be a little bit different from what we were just told a few minutes ago. Then we we'll look into scholarly information retriever. Then we we'll look at chat GPT and scholarly information retriever. We we'll look at the comparative analysis of this open AI and other search engines, which we are used to before the arrival of uh, chat GPT. Then we also look at some criticisms regarding the use of uh, chat GPT for scholarly information retriever. Then what does the future hold? And uh, then we conclude. Now, because I know there might be questions at the end of the presentation, regarding everything we've had. Let me just quickly move on. And um, I, will, I will look at it, sorry, okay? <clears throat> now, conceptualizing OpenAI now. Now, according to OpenAI itself, and you just, bear with me, Some, most of the things I will be doing here today, I will restrict myself to this uh, slide so that I don't want to go out of where I've prepared here. AI issue is a very big one and sometimes it may be challenging to handle. But Open AI is an artificial intelligence uh, research laboratory that consists of a team of experts, researchers in the field of AI. And in 2015, it was funded by a group of technology industry. Among the leaders in that industry, which include Elon Musk, of course, that's an household name in technology now, and uh, Sam Altman and others. Now, the major aim of OpenAI is actually to create an artificial intelligence system that actually brings benefits to humanity in diverse ways. And the major essence of this open AI is to enhance productivity. And you don't forget the other time when Dr. Kelly was talking, one key thing we cannot take away from uh, these advances in technology is the intelligence as aspect of it. But this is quite different from human intelligence. This is machine, uh, intelligence for the benefit of human beings to enhance productivity. And when we talk about this productivity, it can be in diverse ways. It can be in production. It can be in management. It can be in diverse ways. And even coming to the library world now, even in professional library librarianship, we have seen libraries in which artificial intelligence, robots, and the likes 
are serving the library users at circulation and different unit of the library. So the major aim is actually to enhance productivity. When we talk about this, one of the ways by which productivity is measured is the time it takes to accomplish a task. So that one is very key and central. And in order for this goal to be achieved, and open AI actually conduct research in various areas. And uh, again, we've heard about this, that when we talk about various areas of AI, we cannot but mention natural language processing, robotic, machine learning, and host of others. And um, now, having established open AI, then we need to also look into scholarly information retriever. And when we look at information life cycle generally, no library goes ahead to acquire resources or manage collections or render services without having the users in mind. Specifically, the needs of the users determines the kind of resources and services that libraries all over the world, you know, will render. And uh, the needs influence the resources to be acquired for services to be rendered. Uh, the same thing is applicable to here because we have users in mind. And uh, one of the specific needs of users is actually to retrieve information. Information is meant for different purposes, for recreation, for business, and what have you. But in this context, we're looking and focusing on scholarly information retriever. And that is for academic purpose majorly. And this is concerned with uh, representing, searching, and manipulating large collections of electronic text and other human language data to satisfy a particular need. And that's according to the authors cited there. And another thing is that we should not forget that over the years and since the time in memory, researchers and other knowledge managers use specific information retriever tools, you know, because their information retriever responsibilities and deliverables are different based on each discipline. If you have served as, um, for instance, uh, either collection development uh, li librarian or reference or scholarly communication librarian, you we will always remember that, of course, we have different databases for different disciplines. So the task at hand probably closely linked with uh, the discipline or the problem to be solved determines what a particular user or group of users will go for per time. And therefore, we could say that uh, the researchers at every point in time or at different times will explore different databases and sources, including machine and humans, to retrieve documents or information or data or knowledge that are relevant to their studies. And this could take place actually either through reading, either studying, either scanning, downloading or comparative analysis. And I want us to note the last word here, which is comparative analysis, because we're coming there later in this presentation. And uh, there are different models of information behavior that established what I just mentioned in that bullet point three. Don't forget, just stay tuned very soon, we get to where we are going. And uh, in the library over the years, two of the sources from where scholarly information are retrieved by researchers, by students, by faculty members, uh, is it that they explore search engines and food or food text uh, databases. And uh, that is when they want to work online. Of course, they make use of books, uh, journals, I mean, newspapers and other sources. Now, specifically now, the introduction of chat GPT by OpenAI has brought a new dimension entirely to scholarly information retriever dynamics. And I need to also add that 
this chat GPT is just one of the products of open AI. And we're going there very soon. And uh, essentially, IR, especially with focus on scholarly articles, are central to the success of communi scholarly communication process. It's a life cycle, and we all know it starts from the point of generating idea to developing it, to conducting an extensive and critical literature review, to data collection and all that, see, up to the point of processing that uh, research finding. So it's a lot of, uh, is a process actually. And looking for relevant articles is one of the major products. I mean, one of the major engagements that usually lead researchers to, to the library. Now, at this point, if you are still following, and uh, you've had something about chat GPT. Can you just send some emoji to, to me here? I want to see either at the chat bot or uh, I can't see anybody. If we are still following. Yeah, we, we can hear you and you should Okay, be able perfect, to perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, I like that. I just want to be sure that uh, I am still communicating. Thank yeah. you so much. You're here. We're here. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's quickly look at chat GPT and uh, scholarly information retriever. And like I said earlier, what we are considering basically and majorly in this presentation about open AI is chat GPT. And uh, for many of us, I'm sure we've, we've, had some things or we've done something with uh, chat GPT before. And uh, now chat GPT is an innovative uh, platform that make use of uh, artificial intelligence to enable a very simple communication between humans and computers. Specifically, it is a language model that makes or that has been designed to understand human inputs, which can be in form of a query. And based on that query, it then produces response or responses in text format that is almost the same with natural language or natural human language. And you can see that we are going back to what we were introduced to earlier about machine learning, about natural language processing, about chatbots and the likes. So we are making effort now to go deeper into it. Now, the platform makes use of cutting edge algorithms that are operating on a deep learning model. And that model has been trained on a massive amount of textual data, which is able to analyze natural language queries. And based on those queries, it generates relevant responses from massive databases of academic resources. Now, what that means is that the platform has been trained using certain algorithms. Algorithms are computer language. We may not be able to go into that, whereby they write codes and some stuff behind the scene in such a way that when you impute a particular query, uh, the system generates responses for the searchers and uh, there may not be too much difference between those responses and compared to, say, a reference librarian talking to you. That's an interesting development. That's an awesome innovation in the area and the arena of scholarly information retriever. And you don't forget, this is a very good one because it doesn't take too long before responses come. 
You don't have to scan through, go to the back of a textbook, looking for indexes, looking for descriptions, reading the table of context. You just go there, you search what you need, you impute it, and it brings you results. But we're going somewhere. Now, ChatGPT is integrated with uh, various academic databases and resources, and that enables it to scan through resources and based on the scanning, it retrieves the most relevant information according to it, and then present it to a user or a researcher in a concise and easy to read and understand format. It will have simplified it. It will have, you know, do go extra mile to present the result in a very and easy to understand way. In such a way that a researcher does not have to spend so much time trying to figure it out and understanding what the, 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 the text says. And you don't forget one of the things we were taught in library school is that we shouldn't waste the time of library users. So every user wants to have their needs met within a very short period of time. Now, let's move on and look at the comparative analysis of chat GPT and other search engines. You will remember that before now, we were complaining as librarians that, oh, our libraries are becoming underutilized. Like, I mean, that users prefer to make use and engage with um, uh, search engines than coming to the library. And based on these uh, complaints, Libraries also rose up to the challenge and uh, certain services were introduced into the library services. And that's why subscription to databases and all that began institutional repository that gives a kind of uh, the same experience they have online and the same thing be presented and rendered to them by the libraries. And, uh, with the coming of chat GPT, there were arguments and uh, discussions that, oh, the end of search engines have come, uh, that the search engines will no longer be relevant. Oh, search engines have taken so long. You know, before the arrival of chat GPT, there were, there were criticisms and analysis of major search engines. Take for instance, Google, that, oh, when Google gives you uh, uh, responses, you get more of uh, recall than precision. Uh, that oh, some people will even say, oh, I can't find what I'm looking for on Google. That Google seems to give you over abundance of information that even leads to information overload. That I can't cope with searching for information on Google. But now chat, chat GPT is here with another algorithm entirely that is different from uh, search engines. And so what we're going to do here is we will look at chat GPT versus Google, for instance, because globally Google is claimed to be uh, the most popular and the most used the search engine. And after that, we look at chat GPT and other generative AI. Because the generative AI that we have currently, at least the major ones, uh, is not restricted to chat GPT. We have other ones. So quickly, let's look at this. Okay, uh, if you can see this very well, we have Google versus chat GPT. Then I got this online. And I need to also report that the presentation I'm making here today is actually part of, our, of my ongoing research here at the University of Wisconsin, the work in the United States of America, because we're looking at various angles to the development in in the open AI so that we can make scholarly recommendations for viable information policies for the adoption and improvement in the area of open AI. So when we look at Google versus ChatGPT, in terms of their purpose, 
input and output format, the scope, the training, the strengths and limitations, they are different. Why search engines serve the purpose of finding information? The purpose of chat GPT is actually about AI language model to understand and generate human-like responses. It's like conversation, it, it is conversational. Like you are chatting on WhatsApp, like you're chatting on Facebook and other, other social media platforms like that. So they are never the same. Now, in terms of input and output, Google takes in search queries and returns web pages or information. Now, in the case of chat GPT, it understands what you are trying to do or what you are looking for, then it generates natural language response, which is based on the given prompt or context. And talking about the context is still subjective, as we're going to see very soon in this presentation. Now, for the scope, Google covers a wide range of topics and information on the internet. But chat GPT responses is always limited in scope based on its training data. Then I forgot to mention that for chat GPT, one of the restrictions is that uh, any information beyond year 2021, you may not be able to find it when you make use of chat GPT because the model, the algorithm model with which uh, the system is trained is limited and restricted to available responses up until year 2021. And uh, we can see other differences between the two, but let me go to the last one. The limitation is that for Google, that you may not always, Google may not always provide the most accurate or relevant results. It, it opens you to different alternatives. But for um, chat GPT, it may have limitations in scope and may generate responses that are not always accurate or appropriate for the given context. And this is a very serious point, especially for academic or scholarly information retriever. Chat GPT, even on the own page, will tell you its own limitation by itself. And you know, except that you are working in the arena of history or anthropology, research has taught us to be updated to be current because for you to be correct, you have to be current. And that's one limitation that we have seen about this analysis. So if between 2021, this is the middle of 2023, there are many developments that are taken, I mean, that have taken place, but chat GPT cannot give you such information. Now let's move to other aspects. Aside, aside from chat GPT, other generative AI that we have, which is similar to chat GPT is Bing and Google Bad. Bing is from Microsoft. Then Bad is from Google. Now, within the time that the open AI came up with the idea of chat GPT, Certain developments have also taken place in other search engines like Microsoft and Google, and that gave birth to Bing and Bad. And uh, I don't know, just similar to what I what I was trying to explain regarding Google versus Chat GPT, you can see the differences in regarding their types, their purpose, their input, technology, training data key features and applications. And uh, if were to be that this is a workshop, we will have done some hands-on training <laughs> on to do a comparative analysis of the three. 
that would have been uh, a good one, but this is something we can do on our own. We can try something on Bing. We can try something on Google Bad. Then we can try something on Chat GPT. But let me quickly make this uh, um, um, clarification, especially with uh, Google Bad. Google Bad. I'm, I'm on the technology now. Here, I'm on the technology now. Oh, okay. Yeah, now, I was for, just going to say, John, that time is going, so you may need to kind of try to round up here so that we have oh, a Okay, minutes. so how many minutes do I have left? Uh, well, you had uh, 30 minutes, and that's what you've taken right now. And so if you can round up just a little bit, maybe we'll take a question or two, okay? Okay, I will also round up. I think this, this particular slide is very, very important. Okay. Now, for the search, for the technology, the Bing uses search algorithms, bad make use of natural language processing and AI, but chat GPT use deep learning. Now for the training data, Bing connect back to web pages and that gives you opportunity to link with other resources. Now, the other two are restricted to one text corpus and the other one vast text focus. Then the key features, we have them there. Now, I have the benefits of chat GPT for scholarly communication here, scholarly publishing. It is good for so many things, even in research areas, when you want to conceptualize your statement of problem, or you don't know how to start the research, you want to go for your background to the study, and know that there are so many things to do with chat GPT in scholarly communication or scholarly publishing, if you want to retrieve information. Now, part of the criticism for chat GPT use when it comes to scholarly information retriever, like uh, Dr. Kelly was saying the other time, we have issues with ethical standpoints. Now, the papers that chat GPT will give may be seen as unoriginal then that may be problematic because of bias in data sets. And that may be linked with gender race and all that. Now, chat GPT will not give you opportunity to know more about authorship attribution. And is a major problem in the creation of new knowledge using AI. And that's probably one of the reasons why journal articles will not take AI generated articles. And if anybody is trying to do that, or our students in our theological institutions are trying to do that, there are different AIs as well that detect machine produced articles. Now, the use of chat GPT for scholarly communication retriever may not enhance critical analysis skills. You know, in literature review, you have to compare and contrast where is the limit, where is this coming from, before you can make a position and make claim for the relevance and significance of your study. Chat GPT will not do that at all, at all, at all. Then we have copyright issues, plagiarism concerns. And when we talk about plagiarism, it's not just about copying. It's, it goes beyond that because it includes paraphrasing without proper citation because plagiarism is about idea, not about text. And uh, uh, Chat GPT has been found to produce academic essays with missing references. So it is not good for scholarly review of literature. And um, other things is it lacks real world understanding it's uh, it's difficult with long text, long context understanding. When what you are trying to do is too long or is being repeated, it may cause problem. And now, as I conclude, because I find that when researchers are at the point of doing research, especially students in theological. Uh, institutions, they run up and down because they believe library can solve uh, most of the challenges they have. Now, for us to remain relevant as theological librarians, what is the way forward? Now, it is often necessary to carefully design experiments 
and also to evaluate models responses critically and combine chat GPT with other tools, with other data sets and human reviewers to ensure the validity and reliability of the research findings. For scholarly information retriever, chat GPT alone is not reliable and it's not recommended. And we need to let our, our community members know and even train them on that. Now, beyond the emotional intelligence, there is a need to develop our critical digital literacy skills among theological librarians and researchers in Africa. Because that's the only way by which you can know which one is correct. If we cannot critically, if we cannot do critical analysis of a material, then we consume anything that comes our ways. And once our users discover that we cannot meet their needs, then they look for alternatives and there may not be justification for our, for our being there. Now, for advances in technology through generative AI, not to influence digital colonialism in Africa, there is a need for transition in the job roles of theological librarians from bookkeepers to digital navigators. And this requires set of skills in digital minimalism. We are digital navigators. We are not just to point them to books. We should be able to point them to technologies and how to ethically use technology responsibly to contribute to the knowledge pool globally. And as technology advances, innovation will be on the rise. Therefore, technology, I mean, theological librarians need to continually update their research and digital skills to remain relevant in the changing world. And uh, in conclusion, there is no doubt that uh, Chat GPT as a form of generative AI symbolizes a major step forward in the field of scholarly information retriever. However, it has prospered to transform the way scholars gain access to academic information and resources. And uh, the tool and related technologies have the potential to significantly impact academia and scholarly publishing. As this technology evolves, it is likely that platforms like GP, chat GPT will become even more sophisticated and powerful. However, it is important to carefully consider the cognitive and ethical implications in the use of this technology for scholarly information retriever. And as we look into the future together, efforts will be central to activities in scholarly information retriever. Reference librarians, especially, we need effective skills in AI tools navigation to render services that ensures user satisfaction. And on this note, I want to stop here and say thank you everybody for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know we've been challenged by this, haven't we? I mean, a lot of these concepts, um, I only encountered them a few months ago, and I'm maybe some of you have not really encountered them. But uh, as this technology develops, I know we're going to be encountering them more and more in our schools. And since we are the information retrieval experts, you know, we're going to be asked how to deal with this in our schools. So, um, John, there are two questions, one question that has been posted in the chat. Let me read that to you. We're going to take about five minutes for questions. I know that's not much, but um, from the College of Theology at Igedi Ikiti, they say, how can this profound productivity be achieved and benefit the library users, most especially in theological institutions? Have you got an answer? <laughs> Well, Dr. Kelly Campbell is also here. Yes. He's my senior person, and I know Dr. Nkemi is still available here. She's so much passionate about technology, and uh, during our days in library advocacy group, I learned so much from that woman. Now, I will say that there is no one way to this. Uh, how can this program productivity be achieved and benefit? Now, we should be willing as library, as theological 
library people. You know, sometimes until I go to the theological seminary, before I go there, I've not really heard so much about theological librarianship in Africa, even at conferences. At... So sometimes I wonder, and of course, we all got the same certificate. We got to the same, we've gone to the same university to acquire the same degree. So I think it starts with we, the library professional in theological institutions. If the management of our seminaries do not really know what we can offer, then there is no way huge investment will be made in us. And how do we mail that? It starts with our contributions to major scholarly issues in our communities. It starts from committees that we serve, journals, and different things. So if we want to really show ourselves for our productivity to be measured, then we've got to ask ourselves, how have we gone, professionally speaking? Have we noticed, have they really know our worth and what we can do. So I would say our involvement directly in intellectual discussions and scholarly activities regarding supporting members of our community is very, very germane to this. And I will stop there so that I give Dr. Campbell also opportunity to answer, but that's my point for now. Thank you. Kelly, I know you put something in the chat. Can you um, speak to that or shall I just read it for you? Are you still awake? <laughs> no, I'm still awake. Um, I think the challenge is exactly figuring out what works best for our users, and we do this all the time. We determine what our collection is, we determine what services we are. So I was thinking after doing this presentation, um, I want to have my staff do some research and do some testing out and with our student workers and to see from their perspective what is helpful to them and what is not. So um, the productivity, um, I think, is a piece. And then because I have a lot of international students that work in my library, I want, and so they've got second and third languages. I'm curious to do some field testing in my own situation to see what's productive and what's not productive. But I think it's the selecting and the curating of the information that is what we do. That's part of our jobs is selecting and curating and staying ahead of the curve in technology areas. Okay, good. Does anybody who's here have a question that you want to, to uh, ask Dr. John or Mr. John, uh, soon to be Dr. John, <laughs> we'll say that. <laughs> anybody with a question here? Okay, thank you so much. Jo um, oh, wait. Okay, here. You know, some of us are big C people, born before computers. Uh, the, my question is, uh, on this uh, intelligence, <coughs> intelligence and GP, uh, mm -hmm. how do they operate? Do, do, do you have uh, an instrument that is used? <laughs> How does it operate? Let, let me. Okay, he, he was that. saying that he is BBC, born before computers. <laughs> and um, he's not clear how this chat GPT works. What I know about it is it's an app you can download to your okay. computer or your phone. Mm -hmm. And then you ask, you, you construct inquiries, which we know how to do that because we've learned that too, how to make research queries so that you know, know what you're looking for. And you ask that, you type that in, and then the chat GPT brings you back an answer based on the models that have been used to train okay. it. Yeah. Since it was not in the presentation, yeah, yeah. that's why yeah. it's not confused. And that's what um, John was telling us, various different kinds of uh, apps, the chat GPT and B, uh, the uh, BARD, and uh, some of their, there are several different ones. Okay. Yeah. John, did you have something you want to say about that? Yeah, Th thank you, Mr. Short, for that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the application aspect of Ch Chat GPT came about a few months ago because when it started, it was basically web. And it works for both ways. If we go right there at the conference venue and we just type Chat GPT, 
It takes us there, you just register, it is confirmed, then you are there, then you are there. And I don't have enough time, Mr. Short, and I think your, your passion for theological librarianship in Africa must come to reality. We really need to do so much, Ma, uh, in bringing ourselves together for regular training. I tell you, within my short time of experience, it's like, African theological librarianship is a bit far from our colleagues in other, in other uh, uh, types of libraries. And sometimes it appears they've gone far ahead of us. And the basic reason is probably because they have access to regular training and retraining. And I think that's one of the things Dr. John was talking about. I know God will help us by his grace, but we must do a lot, Ma, on critical digital literacy. It's not just about information literacy. It's not just about digital literacy. The world has actually gone far beyond that. The key concept now is critical digital literacy. Thank you. Good. We're glad we've got people like you to help us with this. Now, um, okay, one more question, because we need to move on from this. We have another section. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to ask Dr. Kelly Kamper. Kamp 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 uh, to what extent do we uh, compare human intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence, and then we have chopped GPT, to what extent do we need to go to harmonize and appreciate the human intelligence? My computer was going wild. Um, that's artificial intelligence. Um, I think the challenge is um, we can never recreate human intelligence. I think we're God created in that image. Um, I think there's nuances and there's different ways with that. But I think the scare right now for people is that IA is learning so fast. So in some of the documents that I read, they had an IA take the law exam in the United States to be a law lawyer, and they were scoring in the 90th percentile. And when they first took the test, they were like at 75. And then six seconds later, they scored in 90%. So the capacity of machine learning is so, I guess, because it's more organized and simple and not complicated like human learning, it can learn so much faster. But when the machine intelligence is learning so fast, it doesn't have the reasoning and some of the ethics and morals and things that are built within us as human beings. And so that's the disconnect right now. One of the articles I read was really calling for, um, I know I, I was thinking about the movies when I was preparing for this. A really old movie is called War Games about where a, you know, a, a machine takes over and wants to start World War III or there's a Will Smith movie talking about IA with a robot who says that he now has his own image. And so I think it, a lot of it goes back to me. I was thinking about the verse, we're made in the image of the Lord. And so that's the controversy right now is the machines can move so fast that they learn so fast, but are they learning like humans learn with intelligence? And how do you find, define intelligence in a way? Someone can know a lot of knowledge. We have faculty, a lot of knowledge, but is that intelligence of how to work with people? So I think it's that definition of intelligence that's really um, driving a lot of the discussions right now. But in the United States, Microsoft opened some of the chat GPI. Um, and IA and other companies were like, you shouldn't have opened that to the public. We're not ready for that to go because we don't have the policies and the ethical and the moral structure in place to where you've let the cat out of the bag, you've opened Pandora's box, all of those kinds of things are happening. So I, that's kind of where my meanderings are. Um, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Okay, we're going to move now from the theoretical to the practical. All of you have books in your library that are torn up, right? 
Um, and um, as I say, you know, it's a it's a common um, uh, saying: you never get a second chance to make a first impression. When people walk into your library and they see books that are tattered or torn up, they immediately get an impression of what kind of service they're going to get in your library and what kind of information they're going to find. So Mrs. Tarpley, Mrs. Margaret Tarpley, is going to give us some brief hints about um, repairing some of your books, the externals especially, so that books sitting on the shelf look good and that they, um, you get a few more uses out of them because none of us have enough money for, to buy all the books that we want to. And so we have to conserve what we have. So Mrs. Tarpley, over to you. Good morning. It's a joy to be here. And I'm addressing this one, not only to our techie uh, people that know about AI, but the BBCs. I have an analog watch here, so I can keep to time. And if you were born before computers, you're going to understand everything that I tell you right now. So, so we are stepping back. It's, this is back to the future because um, our resources are so important and we need to keep them up. And uh, things that need uh, to be used regularly, uh, they will get wear. But first, let me just go quickly through basic repair materials, resources. What do you need if you're going to make your library look nice? What are basic materials that you're going to need to try to find in order to make your library um, look neat as someone walks in? The first thing that we talk about is book cloth, book tape. This is a basic resource that everybody needs to have and it is available, uh, particularly in large cities out here. Deanna has assured me there's library supply places, many places. So book cloth, book tape, and then another important tape is the clear tape. This is library tape that is specially designed for repairing particularly um, paperback items. So I bought special tape and this I ordered from the US, but if you can't find this kind of special tape, scotch, this is scotch tape. This is scotch's highest level packing tape, but it's almost identical. And it's much less expensive. It's not cheap, but it's very excellent. And if you're wrapping boxes, you can't beat it. But this is very excellent too. Everybody, uh, then if you have very precious documents, this is another kind of tape. This is document tape. This little box costs like 10 US dollars. But if you have very important papers, maybe even your administration office would want to know about this. But if you're repairing important books or important documents, you buy special tape. But if you don't have access and you don't want to spend that kind of money, then Scotch makes very excellent this is what they call their gift wrap tape. It becomes almost invisible and it's very high quality. And this is everyone knows Scotch magic tape, I think. But, but you want to find the equivalents. If you can't find actual library materials, then you want to find the highest quality that you're able to use if you're going to repair. And another very important tool is lamination. This is available, clear lamination. And I'm going to show you just in a moment how to use each one of these items. You also need good quality scissors. You get what you pay for and good quality scissors are worth paying extra for if you're going to use them frequently in your library. Your library workers will bless you if you provide excellent scissors. And then here are the little sticks because one of the things that we learned many years ago in Obamashaw is, this is Pritt, but Ponal is the wood glue. It's flexible, it's excellent, it's available almost everywhere. 
and it's non-organic. You need to be very careful because what we found out in our library, I've been in other library meetings and you know, sometimes you have insect problems. Well, we were actually poisoning our books, like painting them with poison. But what we found out was that new books never got insect um, infestations. And we realized that in the early years, we did our own binding. And when they were binding, they were using organic, you know, glue originally was made from like hooves of animals and other organic products. You must, you don't want anything organic to be used for glue in your library because it might attract insects. But Ponol is relatively inexpensive and is just so excellent. And these are little sticks that you can use for when you need just a little bit of glue, like for tipping in a page. You can buy, these are skewers, like remember last night they had with the little uh, kebabs. These are kebab skewers. And Deanna has taught me that they make wonderful glue dabbers when you need to tip in a page. So let me see if there's other supplies. Now, this, these are little wings. I'm going to give everybody a, a sample of these to take home. Um, what you can do is you can make your books look nice. Can, let me get this to see now, he can see. see this is an old book. It's a wonderful standard, History of Israel by Bright. It's one of the classics in um, uh, Bible history. And, but this book is excellently bound, but it's had so much wear because it's so important and so used so much. But you can fix the corners with little wings if you want to, or you can cut book tape to do the same thing. You don't have to buy special materials. So now let's quickly look at using some of these materials. Okay, lamination. If you want every paperback, you know, paperbacks don't wear well if they're heavily used, but they will wear a lot longer if you will uh, laminate them. And you cut your lamination a little bit bigger than the book, and then you trim it, cut the little end off, and fold it in and fold it over. And so it will extend the life of the book for a long time. And you cut it, you just lay your book down and a straight edge, everyone needs a straight edge. So that's another important piece of equipment. Then the ponal. Some books need both book tape, and when you look inside, they need reinforcing with uh, uh, some gum. And sometimes though books, they just need to have a little bit of gum. You, book cloth is expensive and you don't want to use it. You don't want to have your workers uh, just using it for anything and everything all the time. Yesterday, I got some books from the library and this one, the spine was really still okay, but it was starting to flap. So I just used some glue under it. Then in order for it not to stick to the other books, this is wax paper. That's another very handy um, item to have. I put the glue on here and Ponal will dry clear. So you don't have to worry, you don't have to be too careful with it because it dries clear. You put the wax paper on it and then you put rubber bands on it to push down the glue to give it a firm holding. And uh, you can also, after you use uh, the, uh, this book needed a new spine. So I used the cloth book tape but I cut a little window because it had a spine label. And you know, spine labeling can be a lot of work for someone. So I cut a little window so that we retain the spine label. But you see, it also was cut longer. It's an inch longer and you trim it and you fold the little ends in to hold it firmly. And then if you want to, you can use a magic marker and even put the 
title of the book back on it so that when your persons are looking for books, they can read not only the spine label, but these are just permanent magic markers that are very handy. And I'm just looking for um, other things. One of the things when you're thinking about, this was just an overview of um, resources, equipment, but when you're doing repair, first of all, is this worth repairing? When something comes to you and it's falling apart and you look at it and you say, well, nobody's checked this out for about seven years and I have a newer addition, do you even want to repair it? The other thing you have to look at is you have to look at the item and find out if it's complete because if it's starting to fall apart, you may have actually lost pages. This one didn't start with the first page. This one has several of the uh, pages missing, as does this one. So I think these, if they're important, need to be replaced, not repaired. But if it's in reasonably good condition and all of the pages are there, then you can open it up. See, someone has used tape, but the tape won't last very long. It'll be temporary. But uh, that kind of tape won't really hold the book together very long. But this book is in reasonable condition and with some Ponal in, put inside. And then since it's a paperback, I would probably choose to use clear tape to reinforce it. Or if it were an important book, I would laminate the whole cover. And so, what you look at is, now here's a, an example of a book that just needs some tender loving care. See, it's just got some little flaps that are sticking up, but this is still a relatively strong binding. And you can, it's got a spine label, it's got a title. So what I would do with this one is, I would carefully put glue in these spaces that are flapping. And then I would get my wax paper and my rubber bands. And so these, this is just a quick overview of what you can do, what it looks like when you're repairing. Sometimes all you need to do is rubber band it with the um, uh, gum. This one, the gum was a little excessive, but it, all it needed was gum. It didn't need... Um, book tape. And this is another one that we have saved the spine label and we have written the title on. And the Bright um, History Book, and here's one that I just wanted to show you for an example. Another strong one, Why I Am a Baptist. This would be a very important book. This one just needs glue and rubber bands and wax paper, and it's ready to go back on the shelf. The things need to dry. You need to let things dry. I would say 48 hours, 72 hours if it's humid. Um, and so um, with some investment in materials, equipment, you can make your library, um, um, we call it fluffing. <laughs> we can make it look nicer. I would also like to point out to us that on YouTube, there are lots and lots of videos on how to repair books. So if you want more information, just search book repair on, on YouTube and you'll get lots of little videos about it, lots and lots of them. Um, so we really thank Mrs. Tarpley for that. She is the book repair queen. When she was the librarian at Abomashaw uh, many years ago, she had, um, uh, crews of students and all the rest of us that she was our boss who did lots of book repair and it really helps to brighten up your library if it doesn't have all those and it'll save your books too now um, we're almost to the end of our time but and and lunch is waiting but did anybody bring any questions you know we had the time the peer-to-peer -peer sharing did anybody, does anybody have an issue that you're really dealing with in your library that you'd like some input into?
or a program that you're doing that you're proud of and you'd like to tell us about it? Uh, my name is David and I'm a pastor and teaching as well at the seminary. I'm trying to build a resource center, books for the pastors, but I don't have the skill to do the cataloging. Okay, I've learned about the repairs, but the skill of cataloging is still my challenge. Okay. There is a, um, a, a book that I intended to look up. There is the Association of Christian Libraries has a manual that they put out, which is called the Librarian's Manual. And it uh, is very basic, just goes all the way through the whole thing. Um, our, our issue with it is how to pay for it. It costs, a, I think it's around $40 and you have to pay in dollars, that's our issue. But I've often thought that we should get some copies and, and we'll work on that. We may be able to get some copies and bring them to the next meeting, or I will put a, um, I'll put a link uh, in our WhatsApp chat group of where, how you can see it. And if you have somebody in the US that might be able to pay for it for you and send it to you or bring it to you, it's a very useful book. It's, it's a, a you know a, a large size and it's 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 a paperback but it's large and fairly thick and it really covers the basics of the library for um, non librarians basically mm -hmm. so, yeah Maggie it doesn't have the, any of the Dewey systems in it uh, because I, don't, I think the cataloging numbers are one of the things that you know okay. for basic okay um, thank you for reminding of that um, there is a uh, there are a couple of websites that you can use. Um, I'll put those in the chat too. There is something that's called OCLC Classify. It's a free website and you can put the title of your book in there and it will give you a Dewey call number or an, a Library of Congress call number for the book. It will give you subject headings that have been used by other libraries. See, it's kind of like this chatbot thing. You know, it's, it's a crawler, it brings in books. It's done by OCLC, which is a very important um, library resource, but that one is free. I'll put the link in the, in the uh, chat, the WhatsApp chat, and you can go and use that. And that would be probably a very helpful thing for you um, because it does have those things, uh, for people who don't have a Dewey, you know, there's a Dewey schedule of, of numbers. There's an LC schedule of numbers, but the LC schedule is like four volumes and it costs a thousand five hundred dollars and, and most of them are moving online now, but that OCLC classify will give you your basic information for free. And that's really helpful. Um, in our prior programs in 2018 and 2021, we did not record those, but on the ABTEM website, if you go to the resources tab and you scan down through there, you'll see the um, uh, PowerPoint presentations that were made in, in those other programs, and you can look at some of those. One of those was about these kinds of things, how you can get information that will help you if you're a lib you know, a, have a small library and you don't really have a, a professional librarian and how you can help someone to do those things. There's a, um, Mrs. Tarpley had a um, bibliography of open access journals where you know people can your your you can refer your students to those open access journals to get journal articles for free if you can't afford databases and then there are also a um, um, I made a list one year of all kinds of different websites and things like that that were free like there's a there's a um, a website that's called Hymnery hymnary.org, which is in one of those things. I could redo them. That, for your music students, you can get the lyrics, you can get the tinge, you can get the history, you can, there's all kinds of stuff. There's the Dictionary of African Christian Biography. If your students are doing church history for Africa, you can use that, they're all, they're all free. The, standard, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is available there. 
anyway, those things will help you, and I'll put links for those in the chat GPT. You just, I'm the chat GPT. <laughs> the, in the WhatsApp chat, chat, and you can also go on the website on the resources tab and see those things. So that, that list is currently available on the website? On the website. Okay, right. Yeah, those are all available okay. on the website. Good. So, I, um, we, our time is up. Would Lunch be, is waiting for... Would there be a specific uh, association or network of libraries that you would recommend and say, check these guys out, they will be helpful? Well, the, um, you know, the people who greeted us at the beginning. Oh, the people who greeted us at the beginning, I don't know if were you here at the yeah, very beginning. I was, so okay. Um, the, that would top the list on your recommendation. Yeah, at, the ADLA is the, the Theological Library Association for America. There's also one for Europe that's called Beth. And I'm not sure there may be some others. We don't have one for Africa. As far as I know, we're it. Okay. We are the Theological Library Association, what we have right here, rather informally. But um, as Dr. John said, there are, um, you can get a membership right now, as far as I know, membership is um, free in ATLA. You just and have to register. You just have to register, and we, we'll put that on there. It may, that may change. For the last two years, it's been free. Well, actually, it's, it's um, pay what you can. And if you say, I can't pay, which most of us, in Africa can't because we can't, you know, the foreign exchange business. You can just say, I can't pay, and you get it free. Okay. And you get all the access that everybody else gets. That may change pretty soon, but the um, Atlas Serials, which is the premier database for theological research, makes so, it's done by Atla, and it makes so much money that they can afford to help some of us <laughs> who can't pay. And um, so that, that's, the, that's the primary one for um, librarians, um, it, for theological librarians. And then the AFLIA, which the, Dr. Helena told us about. And Dr. Cam is on the, on the chat with us now. She could tell you more about that too. Maggie. Do, does anyone here have a journal that's being put out by your institution or somebody in your area? Um, uh, ATLA is always looking for African journal titles to add to Atlas, and they actually pay every time somebody looks at your article, you get a little bit of money. Um, uh, several of our seminaries in Nigeria get money every year because they're indexed in Atlas. So I always want to make sure we, we put out word in case some of you, we found out there's one from South Africa, the Southern Baptist Journal of Theology. Um, I, we're encouraging him to submit it for yeah. indexing. But anyway. Yeah, I, like our school, um, we, we get seven or eight hundred dollars a year from our being in that, in that database. And they pay us in dollars. They transfer it to our account. So if your school has a journal, you can let me or, or Maggie know and we'll, we'll submit it to them for a possible entry into that, into that. So it's really good. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you all of you Zoom people. We had almost 50 people with us on Zoom. The, I think the most we had here was 17 in person, and then we had about 50 people in Zoom. So I think that's a really good sign that theological libraries are important and that we need to be doing more. And we have had some suggestions that we need to maybe as librarians meet more frequently. Um, maybe we could try to have a, some more a, a Zoom conference yeah. before next year. And, yeah. you know, there's so many things we could talk about. Bibliographic instruction, mm -hmm. critical digital um, uh, literacy skills, mm -hmm. um, uh, professional development, mm -hmm. uh, just so many different issues that we could talk about. So let's talk more about that, maybe having a Zoom where everybody is Zooming. Yeah. So. Um, and having some things like that, and maybe even just little meetings where, you know, again, we, it's peer to peer. Bring your problems, and we'll, the, we'll talk about it. So, okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. We